Welcome to the Neural Implant Podcast, where we talk with the people behind the current events and breakthroughs in brain implants in an understandable way, helping bring together various fields involved in neuroprosthetics. Here is your host, Ladin Yurichek. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Neural Implant Podcast. Today, actually, we have a different type of episode. So we were lucky enough a few months back to have Jennifer French of Neurotech Reports come by University of Florida and stop by the auto lab as well, where, where I'm working. And this was cool because she is actually a neural implantee. So she has had a spinal cord stimulator ever since her um, paralysis, I don't know, almost two decades ago. And so it was really cool. It was a very special treat to be able to talk to somebody that's actually undergone this process. Because a lot of times as scientists and designers, we don't close the loop. We don't actually talk to the consumers and see what they need, see what they want. So it was amazing to get her experience experience and her insight on what this has been like and even some of the devices that they use because a lot of the devices as you might hear in the in the show they're kind of old it's not especially flashy or anything like this so i hope you enjoy it i do want to say that if you like this show and if you want to see other you know neuromodulation or prosthetics professionals then you can go to the 2019 bioelectronic medicine forum in new york and this is on april 4th and it's going to be really, really cool. I'm really excited about this. Uh, this is a one-day management and investment conference for the bioelectronic medicine industry. And it features lots of presentations from several entrepreneurs and developing promising new applications from established device vendors and, of course, investors, which are funding this growing industry. So if you, if you like this, if this sounds good, then feel free to register for the conference at neurotechreports.com or call 415-546-1259. And actually, as a special bonus for Neural Implant Podcast listeners, if you mention this podcast, you'll not only be supporting the podcast, but you'll also receive a free ebook on my feed again, written by Jennifer French and published by Neurotech Press. So I think this is really one of the best conferences of the year, and I would highly recommend that you go check it out. So just mention the con- mention the podcast as you're signing up, maybe email them, and yeah. So now, on to the episode. That was so closed loop, and I think uh, what Chris Pham said at our, our, um, our bioelectronic medicine forum is that closed loop is a lot harder than we thought it was. Yeah, it's not as easy as we think it is. So um. that seems to be the mantra of neural engineering. <laughs> <laughs> well, from my perspective, I think from the lab's perspective, it's the sensing, the to get as a diabetes patient who uh, is contemplating going closed loop. It's really stressful to think about the sensors. And if you trust them, you know, that this closed loop controller is making potentially life decisions. Mm -hmm. And what if the the sensor's off by 20%? Um, You know, that's a big deal. And stimulation's easy. It's been easy for a long time. Right. But sensing, I think. And and the, the algorithms in the middle, now you can just put them into machine learning and it'll figure it out. The Ohio State and Patel groups are evidence. Working on that. Yeah. But aren't we culturally becoming more um, trusting of technology? Think about autonomous vehicles and autonomous airplanes and things like that. So we're actually putting our life's hands into other, kind of, if you think about it, yeah. systems that are making decisions for us. More right. proven right. sensors, I would say. Yeah. Right? I mean, an altimeter. <laughs> True. <laughs> on the B-2 bombers that they're <laughs> right for, yeah, they're 50 years, they're still accurate. Right. Wind speed, still there. Mm-hmm. But sensors inside of the body for 50 years. Well, we don't even know if they handle for 50 years, right? We really truly don't know the lifespan. I mean, look at the heart pacemaker, mm-hmm. right? How that was what I was thinking is defibrillators. Yeah. And that's maybe the easiest sensing to do. Right, but how often is it? Are they usually replaced? Aren't they usually replaced between three and seven years, depending? For the battery, mm-hmm. for sure. Mm-hmm. I don't know if the leads are ever moved. I don't think they, they are. They just yeah. yeah, yeah. You just get more spaghetti. Yeah. So they, you, I've seen X-rays of like where it's like you have multiple ones. I think 
the Moss Eisley story. Oh, yeah. Which is so crazy <laughs> to think about. But oh, just, I mean, just, just about open loop pacemakers don't have sensors. Defibrillators do, but if it's just a 1960s level pacemaker, it's just on. Mm-hmm. The I actually took my medical instrumentation class in undergrad from one of the gentlemen that designed pacemakers, the ICDs actually, for Medtronic back in the 60s and 70s. They guessed <laughs> frequently. Uh-huh. So like their, um, give me a second. I, accelerometer. Accelerometer, thank you. I was looking for the word. Their accelerometer was essentially just guessing the position of the patient at random times and their early models apparently had trouble with people sleeping because apparently it was very similar when you were sleeping as running just depends on what access <laughs> you're on so people would uh, complain that their heart rate would skyrocket when they fell asleep and they didn't know why so um yeah very much open loop they were kind of just guessing at what parameters fit they don't they weren't sure a lot of the data they had was based on stray dogs not that, well, I guess 1960s, 1970s, it didn't really matter as much. We didn't have a strong IO cook. But it was actually kind of funny. They just guessed at whatever parameters they thought worked best. So, and you, you don't think that happens today? <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, no, no. Actually, we, we've upgraded. We've upgraded very much so. I think we have machines guessing at the parameters for us now. <laughs> There you go, our trust in machines. Right? Hey, so, uh, Dr. Otto, you love black boxes, right? <laughs> <laughs> the, well, the patient in the loop is, is important. Mm-hmm. For, for tuning your device, you were a big part of that in the beginning in terms of going to the clinic and mm-hmm. turning channels on and off, adjusting levels. But talk about a laborious process, extremely yeah. laborious process. So I think part of what you know, some companies are working on is how do we improve that process so that we can come up with better parameters very quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, what was your process like, actually? We didn't really talk about that before um, at uh, Case and everything like this. Like, how to many find parameters? Yeah, to find and, and how many total hours did it take? Would you say? I can't even tell you that because <laughs> I would spend an entire day on a Biovex machine just looking at one quad muscle. Wow. I mean, wow. literally, that's how many that's contacts do you have how now? Leads? Oh, sure. Oh. Um, we'll have to add and subtract. Okay. We <laughs> cut off a few and we put in others. So, um, 24. 24. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, yeah. We took off two from each side. Yep, 24. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, if it's like the cochlear implant, which I'm guessing is how they fit it originally, they determine threshold for a single channel, determine threshold determine maximum comfortable stimulation level, Mm -hmm. and then try to figure out dynamic range. A happy medium. Mm -hmm. But what what complexity comes with stimulating muscles, particularly for function, is that once you turn on one muscle, another muscle will act differently. So the body doesn't act in isolation, right? right? So you isolate the muscle, you find those parameters, and then you think you come up with something good, but when you flash the system on, you're like, oh, yeah, this didn't work, right? So... It's it's a tougher process sure. than just looking at each electrode and testing it out. So is it only second order, or does two electrodes affect the third? Depends on where it is, mm-hmm. right? Um, and also, and then you put in complexity when you're talking about a cuff electrode that has four channels in it, right? Because it'll start overlapping mm-hmm. and and whatnot. So then you have to figure out how to isolate that. Or you might be recruiting some muscle movement that you don't necessarily want. So with your system, do all 24 channels operate? Or are there some that for... Because you have different patterns, different... I want to stand or I want to kick somebody or I don't know mm-hmm. what, what all of your... my foot, yeah. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> programs, is that so what they call them? with the latest version, because mm-hmm. you know my IST was replaced last year, or the beginning of this year. Um, we each cuff electrode, so I have two cuffs of electrodes, one on each uh, femoral nerve, um, and because we ran out of channels, we only picked the two channels from those femoral nerves and reconnected those, and then we put a cuff electrode on the TA and the gastron, single channel electrodes, so to give dorsiflexion and plantar flexion in the ankles. 
So we kind of shut off two channels that were not really being used anyway, because I can stand on two channels. I don't need all four. Um, and then we gained the, the ankle movement. And that's what we're testing now. So we're really limited on channels. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things about the NMP is that you don't end up with this limitation on channels because it's modular, right? You guys familiar with the NMP, the network neural prosthesis? Device. That oh, Hunter's is a, been Hunter. talking about for the last 20 yeah. years. <laughs> anyway. I, I'm familiar, but they're probably not. Yeah, before I said no. Oh, okay. I wasn't supposed to know. Yeah, no, no, no. He's Making been, sure it's been a long account. time coming, actually. They just did, uh, I think they're on to number six. I think they're on to number six now, um, implant. So the idea was, is when I was implanted, I have a pacemaker type device that's implanted in the abdomen and you have you know, leads that come off of that, that go to different muscles and different peripheral nerves, right? So what happens is, is that you end up in a limitation with, an I, with the IPG, right? So, okay, I end up with a channel count that I can't, I can't expand anymore if I wanted to, but if they want to give you another function, like let's say, um, oh, I wanted hand function, then we'd have to put in a whole other IPG. You'd have to have a whole separate box programs. You'd have to have almost essentially two separate systems. So in simplistic terms, the NNP is really kind of looking at building a network within the body. So if we wanted to provide, you know, hand function and arm function and bladder function and trunk function, you can put in a network into the body, which is your main hub, and then you build modules off of that to be able to go to different functions. Um, and all of that comes back to the main hub, and that main hub is what communicates with your external control device. Mm -hmm. So therefore, you're not implanting a separate kind of IPG for each function. You're kind of building that network off of it. So, if you want to come off and say, oh, "Okay, I want I want eight channels for this function, but I need four channels for this one," or I want to use three channels for sensing, you can do that. You have that flexibility to build that type of system. So, um, so if you want to switch out. programs or activate a program, how do you do that? How do I do it? Mm -hmm. Press a button. <laughs> In a little wireless device. No, well, it's not really wireless. I'm. You have to remember, I was implanted in 1999, so I'm. Uh, wired. <laughs> I'm wired. I've been wired for a long time. Um, so yeah. So this is. So you see how big this is? Isn't that ridiculous? I know. They get sick of me saying that, but um, so this is the control device. So this has all the battery power and the circuit boards that control the implanted system. And then this actually communicates via radio, um, high-level radio frequencies. So I actually tape a coil over where the implant is. So I have an implant here, implant there. And then these actually just go into, go into the box. So it's actually technically wired. Hmm. Yep. But it's, it's wireless across the skin via coil? Yes, okay. mm -hmm. it is. Yeah, so everything's encapsulated in the body. So it's using RF power mm -hmm. to... Um, to communicate with the implant. Where did you get this box? This box? Yeah. Um, Not in 1999? No, 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 no. This is a newer version. But it's smaller. Yeah. Slightly. <laughs> well, no, the big thing is the battery, was the battery, because I used to have to carry around a, a medical grade battery with you. Oh, goodness. Um, so these are now just little camcorder batteries. The so. first box was the size of a Lego guy. Hmm. And yak. Uh, the <laughs> charger was, well, I, my husband would call it like a he, Tim would call it the um, the car battery that you'd have to carry around. So it was just about the size. So now we're using yeah. these kind of old camcorder batteries, right? Mm -hmm. You don't see these around much anymore. It's, those look just like Radio Shack project boxes. They are exactly. <laughs> exactly. There you go. I guess they do still make them, huh? Um, yeah, those are. So that's definitely an improvement from. Yeah, they got yeah. sick of me complaining about it, I think, for so many years mm -hmm. about having to, to carry the batteries around with you. But but so all the battery power is actually transmitted, so so there's no implants in batteries, which is good. And so it has just a really simple LCD screen where you can scroll through and choose whether you want to stand, whether you want to exercise, whether you want miscellaneous things like um, I have a back massage program, so I'm getting a back massage right now, which is kind of nice, <laughs> you know. Um, those are kind of the ancillary things, but it was really kind of built to um, be able to stand. That's what the, the real system was for, is for um, stand and transfers. So um, 
So that's it. So you just press a button and, and, it, stands. and it works. It stands, yeah. Huh. There's a three second delay. There's a there's a ramp up phase. So people can get out of the way? Um, no more so. <laughs> Believe me, if you, you don't have that ramp up and it comes on, it's a jolt. It's, huh. it's a jolt of electricity. Oh. So there has to be uh, a, a kind of a, a, a ramp up phase. So Do you feel it or are you just like, whoa? Oh, yeah, yeah you totally feel it. Okay. So, um, but But that's part of... Let me put it this way. So yes, people feel it by the movement. Uh -huh. um, not everyone has sensation. Yeah. So because of my injury, I have I don't have motor function below my injury point, but I have sensation. So I can feel the bottom of my feet. I can feel when when the muscles are activated. I can feel when they start to fatigue. So all of that plays into it. So like for instance, um, so like, you do get the satisfaction of kicking something. <laughs> yes, I do have leg lifts in this, exactly. So, yeah, so like this is trunk control now. So, I can probably show you so, without any trunk, you know, so to be able to have space to be able to move and pick up things in front of you and whatnot. You can't really, don't really have the full kind of workspace without falling. It doesn't matter how much seating you put into a wheelchair, you really, unless you strap yourself in which you'll see people with high level injuries they'll strap themselves in just so they can get a little bit more movement but if you give trunk control now you're actually sitting straighter now you can actually you have kind of bilateral two-way movement where you you're almost spazzing right now but um you actually have some movement in your and it gives you a stability if you will in your wheelchair right so so like what's been your timeline of capabilities or programs that worked or maybe some stop working at some point some oh you want that history huh okay oh, history, yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. oh well that's well the electrodes have changed over the years too right so if i was implanted in 1999 in fact the irs 8 the original <coughs> ipg i'm still using it today it's still good after almost 20 years of being implanted um so that was the first implant so it was an eight channel implant um and those were uh, mainly epimesial electrodes. So are you guys familiar with epimesial no, electrodes? I'll, I'm not. So they're like a little disc and the electrode actually sits on it. Um, and so they would implant that disc deep into the muscle tissue where the peripheral nerve innervates the muscle. And then they would run the, the lead wires through your fatty tissue to the, to the implant. So um, I had eight channels originally implanted. Six of them were epimesials. So that was in the quads, the hamstrings, and the glutes. And then the two in the lower back were um, intermuscular electrodes that look like a little fish hook. Um, so I used that from 1999 um, until 2003. So 2003, I was only standing on three electrodes. Uh, all the other five had failed. So we went back in and replaced those electrodes. Um, and when they replaced those electrodes, they kind of moved more towards um, there were a few epimesials that they thought was were of a better design, but they did start to put in more intermusculars. Uh, they tend to be a little bit more reliable. Um, but then after a few years, of course, we broke those because, and of course, the ones I always break are the ones that are running your hamstring because you're sitting on it all the time. When you transfer, you're constantly chafing, so it gets the it gets beaten up probably the most out of out of anything. What is the failure mechanism of mm -hmm. them? Like, what what point actually fails on them? The call, like, what is the failure? They don't really know completely yet. I mean, it's individual by individual. I mean, some of them I've had the electrode pop off. Some of them I've had the electrode lead break. Some of them um, they ended up shifting and moving. So, you know, there's a lot of kind of factors that go into that of, of what can fail and what doesn't. Um, so, yeah, so that was 2003 was a revision. And then um, in 2010, it was implanted with the uh, IST, so it's an IST-16, so they put another IPG in any, on the other side. And that's when we put in um, the cuff electrodes onto the uh, femoral nerve. Um, and then we coupled it with other muscles for more trunk control. So we have the quadratus, which is a little bit higher up in the back. You have the glute meads, uh, which give you a little bit more hip control. Um, and then we have the posterior adductors, which are basically your inner thigh muscles. Um, so that was done in 2010. So the goal was that is to be able to have more trunk stability and be able to, to, to get up using, not needing so much assistance from a walker, but having more independence on that. So use that from 2010 until um, 
it was 2017 when the IST failed, so it just suddenly turned off, so I only had the, I, the IRS 8 left. Um, so last December, we went in and replaced the um, IST 16, and with that same revision, we uh, replaced a couple of electrodes that weren't re performing as well, um, and then we implanted the cuffs into the TA and the gastroc to give, um, give ankle function. So, in essence, there's been kind of four major surgeries, if you will, major points. And for most of them, was the failure just kind of like you woke up one day and it failed, or is it kind of a gradual degradation for some of them? Uh, it depends. Like when the IST failed, it, it was acting a little strange, um, and it was needing more RF power to communicate, which we didn't kind of reflect on that until after it failed. Um, but then really it was, I was in San Diego for a regatta, and it turned off. You know, so, um, so yeah, it just it kind of it failed on, it finally so, kind of gave up and it just said, all right, I'm done. I, I'm mm -hmm. curious, this is something that we don't, at least in our lab, we don't normally get to ask. Do you actually have a preference for electrode style? Like, have you found one to work better for you over another? I mean, as... From a As, performance standpoint or from an implanting standpoint? Uh, from a performance standpoint, because I suspect implanting is never fun. <laughs> well, I mean, one of the things we have to think of when we're looking at electrode design these days is that, you know, these surgeries are extremely invasive, right? So the last surgery that we went through to replace the IPG, we actually had to break it up into two surgeries because, I mean, there's a real issue with infection in in operating rooms and we don't want to leave people open for very long so they actually had to split it up between two surgeries instead of just one so when you think about it that your body's going through all the anesthesia and all the trauma not once but twice yeah. right so that recovery time actually took a lot longer than I had anticipated um, so when you're looking at it from a design standpoint you want something that's going to a be reliable that you know is and B is not going to shift um, because one of the issues that happens in the recovery process is you have to wait until the body encapsulates around that mm. electrode and you have to be extremely careful that you don't move while you're still going through that encapsulation process. Otherwise, as soon as it moves, you could very well potentially not get the response that you wanted that you had in surgery. Um, and being able to go in and shift it, you really can't do it that much, right? So that's so, such an interesting standpoint for our work because we don't normally have that. We don't keep our animals, let's say, still for 24 hours a week after implantation. They, we implant them and then they go off and start performing immediately. They, they go back to their, their home cage and, you know, so it, it makes me curious if, you know, we're kind of missing something that's translatable in our work versus what's done in clinic. If they immobilize, let's say, part of your leg for several days, weeks. But think about that, that's not really practical, right? Right. So, um, you know, the people move, they have to move. You know, we're restricted on movements and um, on what you're able to do within that period of time, but at some point people have to still function and move. You can't really, I mean, if you put somebody in a bed for even a couple of days, they lose a lot of strength, right? So we can't do that to the human body. Um, but yeah, figuring out how we can better perform on those electrodes, especially when you're in the pre, the preclinical stage, is really important, right? And the question might be having to move to higher mammals to try to figure that out, right? So, right. you know, a rat and a mouse might, might be such a small body and it might be just their behaviors where you might want to look at something that's a little higher mammal, which of course adds to the cost of everything, right? So um, that's definitely something to think about. But I mean, the other kind of key thing, and we're starting to see this trend in the industry side of things, is that really starting to move to uh, minimally invasive devices, you know, so that we don't have to open up a skull and slap an <laughs> electrode on a motor cortex, you know, how can we do that more? We, we still know that we need that implanted side of things. We can't do everything outside of the body. I mean, I think we've already kind of proven that. There's some things that you can do, but not everything, especially if you're trying to get into deep tissue. So how do we do that minimally invasively? How do we make this process as minimally invasive as possible so that you don't have to go through the trauma of those surgeries or it's easier to deploy where you're not having to take up operating room time? And the neurosurgeons might not want to hear this, but 
you know, if they could do it easier and deploy it easier in a clinic, you know, there's going to be quicker recovery times. It's going to be, you know, from a cost standpoint, it's going to be a you know much more conducive to being able to actually translate it out into a, to a real device. Right? Do you notice that the cuff electrodes perform better? Do they, do they feel better? Is there any kind of... Or versus the hook electrodes or epimuseal? I can't really feel anything, so I couldn't. I couldn't tell you. I could tell you this is that, you know, the the cuff electrodes because there's channels on them, it gives you a lot more flexibility. Okay. Um, and because you're actually going around the nerve, you can be much more selective and use a lot less power mm -hmm. than you can if you actually are just going at the end of the peripheral nerve. So the battery so. lasts longer, <laughs> does it or? I haven't tested that, so I couldn't tell you. <laughs> I couldn't tell you, but I will tell you. I do. Re I, I don't have to replace the battery as much in a day, you know, <laughs> comparably okay. to what you used to do. But that's you know, it's a different box. The cuff electrodes you have are uh, pretty simple case APT. Yep, they're the case cuff electrodes, the old ones, not the fine mm -hmm. electrode, which we know there were issues with that. But do you um, want the fine? If we turn off the camera. If you turn off the camera, <laughs> if, you, if you turn off the recording, I'll tell you. <laughs> Otherwise, no way, I'm not going to say it on the record. <laughs> we won't send, we'll send it to Dominique. And <laughs> I know. I'll get a call tomorrow. What are you saying? <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> exactly. They, they, they'd probably get mad at me for asking that. <laughs> uh -huh. Have you ever had an issue with, like, I don't know, with the coldest temperatures you've been outside or, like, Temperatures. Because we live in Florida, I don't really get exposed to that all that much, and I try not to be. Um, <laughs> yeah, I do, but I try not to do that in the winter. <laughs> I try to do it usually in the summer months. She has to get snow tires. <laughs> yes, yeah, I don't want to. I know. I have, well, I have them, believe it or not, for sand. But, um, but actually, the, it's interesting because the the issue that we do have is with heat. So one of the things that we haven't been able to figure out is that sometimes, not necessarily with this box, but I have another one that I use for cycling, is that the box will actually overheat because the circuit boards are so close. Mm -hmm. We think that it overheats. And while we think it overheats, which the engineers have you still not be able to explain why this happens, is if I stick it in the freezer for an hour and take it out, let it sit for a little bit, it'll turn right back on. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, because of the junctions. There's a difference in thermal expansion. Yeah, but they've 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 told me they've they've tested it in microwaves and in the human environments and all of that. But when me and my physical therapist and we go stick it in the refrigerator, <laughs> we're like, we'll solve the problem right now, you know. So um, okay, guys, new experiment: it. stick it in an oven and <laughs> see if that. Does but an oven is a dry environment, so we don't really know if it's humidity or whether it's. Heat. So what if you pack it in ice? Um, it's not waterproof, so I don't know if I would, unless we, oh, we can, use we can Ziploc bags, we can do something, <laughs> right? <laughs> Could be, but yeah. Uh, it's all circuit stuff. Mm -hmm. Boring. Boring circuit, yeah. <laughs> but still, that's, that's you know, Pretty an important. issue of, because if you've got two circuit boards in here that are working really hard, there's not enough air going you know, yeah, they don't even it. have vents on There's the, no vents this, in these. This Radio Shack project box. Exactly. <laughs> that's, that's what it's now going to be known as. Unfortunately, Radio Shack <laughs> yeah. is out of business. So um, People won't know. They won't know what you're talking about, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's fancy. It's got a you know a screen. I know. It's got a screen. Yeah. Well, they've always had screens, actually. Yeah. Well, see, with the new NNP, it actually interfaces with a smartphone. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's they're coming up with a better interface you know, between them. You know, and that's that's a key issue too. Is what interfaces there are. Um, I think a lot of these device manufacturers are realizing that clinicians are not engineers, and nor do they want to be. So having to figure out parameters for their patients and to the people that they're working with, you have to make it really simple to be able to deploy. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts on. Integrating such a device with a phone, because I mean, it is a bit of a security risk. When no, the Russians don't care. <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends on who the target is. But didn't you hear they can make her kick like him? Yeah, she's, <laughs> she's a killing machine. Say no. <laughs> she just starts marching. 
<laughs> exactly. We all just wake up in the middle of the night. I didn't know watching. she spoke Russian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let me tell you. Well, so, well, security is a huge issue right now. I mean, it's. I mean, the FDA has their whole Internet of Things, but really the whole security of having wireless devices um, is is a hot topic because, I mean, we already have devices, excuse me, on the market that are wireless and communicating wirelessly, but they're very easy to tap if we wanted to. I mean, the reality of it is, is the majority of the devices that are out there, their username is admin and their password is password. Right, and if you talk to the security people at Patel, they'll tell you that that really hasn't changed over the last, you know, three or four years, even with all of this concern about cybersecurity. So we're very loose when it comes to security side of things, and we, if you guys want a new career, it's a, <laughs> that's a big, a big area right now of concern. Right? Every other advertisement in D.C. is a degree in cybersecurity. <laughs> 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 go go figure which city would need it the most. Right. Well, I mean, those are for other issues, but when you think about medical devices, I mean, the TV shows are not that far off that if they want to tap into somebody's pacemaker, you know, they could potentially do that, right? Or tap into somebody's hmm. DBS. They could potentially do that. Not to worry, Dr. Otto, but if, you know, they wanted to give you a little too much insulin one day. It's, and I, I don't have a pump yet. Yes. So. <laughs> I, I'm still hoping. That's probably that, your hesitancy, right? Yeah. You know too much. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, it was it was something I was going to ask you um, with with the phone component. For me, with the sensor, and uh, it comes with a little you know box that you can look at what your blood glucose is, um, and I just hated carrying around another device. It was small, it was like a pager size, but every time I'm going to leave the room, you know, grab my cell phone, grab the keys, oh yeah, grab that other thing. And when it was able to, I could look at it on the phone, you know, it was the last time I ever picked up that other thing. And that was a big deal for me, just to get rid of one thing. And that's part of the reason I've never gone to a pump, is I don't want another thing to carry around. Is that, how, do, how does that factor in for you when even you have, you don't probably go anywhere without a lot of stuff. Yeah, you have to carry this stuff with you, and you're right, it is a real big issue. I mean, I can look at my phone right now and tell you how many kilowatts I'm creating off of my solar panels on my roof, <laughs> but I can't monitor, you know, my glucose level or my, you know, or, or other systems within my body, you know. I think we're getting there. I think, you know, with the you know, with the kind of progress and these Fitbits and, you know, the Apple Watch and all of there, I think eventually we're going to get to the point where we'll be able to monitor those types of things. Mm -hmm. um, I think when you look at some of the newer projects in um, IPGs and interfaces, they're actually building apps instead of giving you another device to be able to control, which makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think, I don't know if you saw the, the release from um, Ron Reinecker's, Reinecker's lab, where they're doing the electrode, the vagus nerve electrode. Um, so it's a wireless vagus nerve electrode, and it interacts with an app. Hmm. So you don't have to carry anything else around with you, um, which is actually really incredibly convenient. Mm -hmm. Right? I think that's where we want to get mm -hmm. to, where we can, I mean, we can manage our own, be much more autonomous in terms of and, and managing, you know, how we. Um, how we interact with our own device that's implanted inside of you, but also that your clinician's able to look at that data as well. Mm -hmm. um, because that's a big issue when it comes to, you know, mental health. You know, I think that's some of the things that um, the Institute of Me Mental Health is actually working on. Because, I mean, right now when you think about it, if you have somebody with depression, they'll go into their office and you get a snapshot in time, and they may or may not be that depressed that day, you know. They might have a good day, they might have a bad day, but that's your snapshot. Mm -hmm. But if you can be able to monitor it over a period of time and you're able to look at that data and really have a good understanding of what's happening with that person in terms of their mental health, you can have a much better treatment plan. Right? Right. This is, funny enough, one of the other problems with, um, I guess, these machine learning algorithms and these um, closed loop systems, which is long time based data. It's, the more data you have to collect, you know, over a longer period of time, the more difficult it really comes to like isolate it down to a single variable to change. Mm -hmm. 
So it's curious. I'm I'm curious to see. I think um, things like the diabetes pump, as they become closer to closed loop, are going to start teaching us a lot about dealing with biologically based, long time based data. But there's there's still a ways to go. Mm-hmm. I know, I know, I don't know anybody personally, but I know of people that have had uh, VNS implants for epilepsy, and that's lifetime. Like the the time base for that data is lifetime. There's over the short scales, we've never seen any correlatable data as to when they'll present with a seizure. They know they they get the auras as they call them, and they know when they're going to have a seizure and they know when to react to it. But we still can't teach a machine to find those things. So it's it's curious. It's curious to me how we're going to learn to deal with those types of things. Right. Well, that's part of what the neural pace device is looking at, is actually um, sensing, uh, having a sensory component to know when the electrical activity is different in the brain for the onset of a seizure. Um, So, you know, epilepsy is an, or a seizure is actually an interesting thing, is that because it's a, it's a neural activity, right? It's a, it's a burst, right? Um, But can we come up with something that can monitor to see if there's some precursors to a stroke? You know, think of it that way what we can do, right? Yeah. I have two questions. Well, the first one might be too probing, so you don't have to answer it. So we can just move on to the second one. That's fine. So, but the first one is so... <laughs> Thank you for prepping that. <laughs> <I> know, <I'm> like, <laughs> do you have any idea? <laughs> oh, no, okay, go ahead. <laughs> um, so is there, like, are, I'm curious to understand if there's any new or different anxiety that you have with getting these new capabilities and these, you know, a bunch of electrodes where one could fail at any moment. Do you ever, I mean, what is your confidence level that, you know, when I plan my life, right, I imagine myself, oh, okay, I'm gonna like run a marathon in, in two years, right? That's like some goal I have. Right? But for you, maybe one of your electrodes could fail and that could totally change. So I, I don't know, do you have confidence that what you have right now is going to last like a month or I, I don't know. Well, part of it is I, is I don't know, right? Because part of this is a clinical trial and that's part of setting the expectations of people that enter clinical trials is that it's a trial. We don't know. It could not work. You could go through an entire surgery and come out and it just doesn't work. Mm-hmm. You know, that's the risk that you take when you enter into a clinical trial. So sure. um, you're always... You're, you're always knowing that it might not work, right? Or it might not work the next day because it's still, that's part of being kind of a human lab rat, right? Um, I think the bigger thing that hits anxiety is that, you know, this is a long-term device. I've had it for almost 20 years, right? And it's still in clinical trials, which is crazy. A, a it's crazy that, that's, that it's been in clinical trials for that long. But B is if the funding goes away, my device goes away. Right? That's a bigger risk than the technology. I mean, we've made a better stride in technology than it is in the systemic systems to, to be able to keep kind of devices going um, and help moving devices into the marketplace where it can be a sustainable device. So that's probably what sits with anxiety much more yeah. than anything else. I no, mean, you think about people that had, I mean, if this was a big concern for some of the early brain implant folks. You know, they, they're, they're severe, they have no function. Um, you know, they might be able to move their head for the most part, or they have locked in syndrome. Um, and suddenly you give them an opening to the world where they can communicate and then we have to take it away, you know? So it's very much, there's a, there's a mental health and a preparation issue that happens with that. That's kind of the, I, that's, that's those considerations that we have to think about when we're actually working with human beings. Yeah. No, it perfectly answers my question. I was, I would have never thought of it. Yeah. Uh, my second question. I, th- I think it's oh, worth sorry. actually bringing up at that point. I've I've seen Hunter talk about this. Uh, scientists as lobbyists to get to the FDA and to convince them uh, to change some of the clinical trial endpoint aspects that patients that are implanted need to remain implanted and need to be supported regardless of funding. So you have an obligation to, 
to those patients. And right. there have been many instances of, of clinical trials that ended for whatever reason, and the patients are left in the wind. Mm -hmm. exactly. and, uh, it's, in, it's important to think about as investigators, but also maybe to advocate. Right? Well, yeah, it's been, well, there's a couple of things there, because it's not just the FDA, though, too, right? The FDA is a is a player in that, but then there's also the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, that are, you know, helping to fund mm -hmm. these types of projects. So the question is, is how do you wrap, mm -hmm. how do we wrap our heads around that, um, and be able to to come up with some type of systemic system so that we're not leaving, you know, people behind mm -hmm. that, you know, have, have put their bodies forward for science. So, but the other kind of key thing too is that we're starting to see a change in the FDA, and particularly in CDRH, where devices live is that they've got this kind of whole um, patient engagement initiative that's going on that you know Heather's been working on for quite some time in terms of really understanding the risk benefit of devices that it for the end user so they can get a good understanding of what that is um, before you start to bring in devices and understanding that perspective from a data standpoint not just a qualitative standpoint so um, things are changing they're slow albeit slow but um, but yeah, it's really important actually for the scientific community, the clinical community, and the end user community to come together to try to advocate around that. Um, because I think that's a component that we don't, we forget about, mm -hmm. right? I, I think it, I, it might have been at a Cleveland New Meeting. I can't remember where I, I first heard Hunter talking about that. And that, that was just completely mind blowing to me. I had never thought about that. Uh, but it's really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I know there's been, well, like for instance, there's been some brain computer interface people that had locked in syndrome, had to be explanted. And, you know, and the engineers, which was, you know, great to them as humanitarians, came up with another kind of optic or eye system to allow those people to still be able to communicate, albeit in a different way, but still gave, left them with a, a window to the world, if you will. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, those are the types of things we have to think about. Right. Second question. Yeah. Do you have to do any sort of like maintenance? Like maybe if you don't stimulate an electrode for an extended period of time, they don't recommend that. Maybe you have to do it once a day or something like that. Yeah, I do it. Yeah, every day for hours because this can be passive. I was stimulating my muscles on the drive up here. Um, but if when you look at a muscle, right, it's going to atrophy. You know, I mean. The, di the human diaphragm starts to atrophy within four hours of disuse, right? Mm. So regardless, your muscles will start to atrophy. And if you don't, it's just like you exercising. If you don't use it, you lose it, right? right? Yeah. So you still have to build up that muscle tissue. So if you stop stimulating, that muscle tissue will start, again, start to break down. So you've, it's, it's one of those things you kind of ha constantly have to maintain. Yeah. I guess I was thinking more of the interface, but I guess atrophy beats that. I mean, that, that would be the limitation. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you would be using it. Right. right. How does that look with your sleep schedule? Oh, I actually. Um, so one of the <laughs> one Literally of the one of the patterns in here is um, an endurance pattern. So it's turning on the electrodes for ten seconds, turning off for ten seconds for about an hour. Mm -hmm. And um, before I go to sleep at night, I do that exercise. So it's about equivalent to jogging five miles. So I hang out and watch, you know, Jimmy Kimmel and. Jimmy Fallon and all of that, and you guys have to go put your sneakers on and go run around the block, right? Mm -hmm. So um, there get, are benefits to that. Do you get tired? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Actually, when I first got the IST, um, I actually couldn't do it for an hour because of the, so many new electrodes. I actually had to stop it because I was my heart rate was so high and I was sweating and it was just, you know, you kind of have to build up your body to be able to handle that. Mm -hmm. You don't feel the pain if there was pain, right? What do you mean by pain? Sore muscles. Yeah, you I mean, mean fatigue. When I run, there's a lot of pain. <laughs> <laughs> is that fatigue? Is that like your lactose buildup in the muscle? Is that what you're saying, or is it just that you really don't want to do it? <laughs> it's emotional pain. <laughs> it's very much emotional. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, when you think about it, I I, I know that the FDA took it off the market, um, or at least, I, or it might have been the consumer um, protection agency that took it off the market. They used to have these little app. Yep. These little uh, these these electrodes that you put on your ab and you can lay on the couch and watch football and you can have you know washboard abs. Well, <laughs> they you know they took that off the market obviously, but you know people are inherently lazy. If I can lay down and exercise sure. and not have to get up and do it, 
you know, why not? So I have a, a follow-up question. You mentioned your heart rate and sweating. And I know with spinal cord injury, autonomic dysregulation is a big deal. Mm-hmm. Do you find that the skeletal muscle stimulation helps with fine-tuning your autonomic system? I mean, does your autonomic, is your autonomic regulation getting better with stimulation? Um, good question. Yes and no. Right. So, um, from a from a standpoint where um, you know, am I am I healthier? Or are some of my systems actually working better? Yes. You know, and that's very anecdotal. But we know that, for instance, you know, if you stop standing, your bladder and bowel system will completely be messed up. You know, um, and we've seen improvements on that. But um, in terms of autonomic dysreflexia, which is a real issue for people with my level injury. Um, I would get it more before I was implanted mm-hmm. and I don't get it as much anymore. Hmm. Um, but when I do get it, it's, you know, it's severe. It's very much like, um, you know, I use it a lot to control spasticity, which is not part of your autonomic system, but, um, you know, but to be able to control spasticity, which can throw you out of the chair, which it used to before I was implanted, you know, I don't have to take any medications for it. I can just stimulate the muscles and relax them. And that's part of what lets me, you know, sleep at night is that I won't be woken up in the middle of the night with spasms, you know, with my legs flying everywhere, um, and it be able to settle down the body. Mm-hmm. Okay. But for heart regulation and, you know, temperature and those types of things. You yeah. mentioned other systems. What, what about blood pressure? Is it, does it help or has it helped? Um, I don't know, and I haven't really monitored it. I mean, it be, I've always had low blood pressure, so that's probably really good. Uh, how about? Well, no. Usually, when they when when a quad goes to a physician, it doesn't know spinal cord injury, and they look at your blood pressure. Oh, they'll right. want to put you on to low blood pressure medication, and we're like, no, we <laughs> we all have low blood low pressure. Blood pressure. Yeah. How about biochemistry, blood chemistry? Do any of those systems? Don't, don't know. I mean, we really don't know. So, but you're asking if they get better? Is that what you're asking? Well, I, it's, it's, again, something that I didn't really know. When I was in graduate school, uh, Dick Stein, you know Dick before? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he uh, was doing a sabbatical at Arizona State with Andy Schwartz and taught a course uh, on his devices. And, and essentially, it was a lot of spinal cord injury in uh, we learned, you know, there was a lot of patient level information that I had never even thought about. Like the number one thing that they would want control over would be bladder function, as if we're all thinking standing. And, you know, it's somewhere fifth or sixth on the list, depending upon the person. And so, but those autonomic systems are, are just so important because the dysregulation. Uh, Thermal regulation, blood pressure regulation, uh, you know, those those systems. You don't think of that in, in a spinal cord injury case, mm-hmm. but it's a big deal. It's a big deal. Yeah, I know some of the other users have said that live in cold climates say that they actually use the system to keep themselves warm because it helps to, <laughs> it helps to you know regular you know improve circulation throughout New their type body. Of shivering. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what about the other way, like? Like if you're dehydrated or you don't have enough electrolytes or you're sick, like do you notice a difference in how effective the stimulation? Um, no, the stimulation really doesn't change. Really? At least I haven't noticed that it hasn't changed. Um, you know, when you're when you're sick like that. Um, One of the behind the scenes secrets of FES is that it's neural stimulation, it's not muscle stimulation. They teach you that early in neuromod. <laughs> so I don't think that the effectiveness of the neural stimulation would be governed by hydration levels as much. You might notice contraction levels with, mm-hmm. with hydration or something, but um, you'd have to be really dehydrated for your neural stimulation to go downhill. <laughs> really dehydrated. Yeah, not good. Hyperkalemia so. levels. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Actually, you know, you mentioned something. You mentioned something a little while ago that you had other secondary benefits from being implanted. 
do you think we might be going after the wrong target? So part of the way the FDA works is they look into primary indications and then secondary indications kind of just get shuffled in along. Oh, okay. you know, what if we aimed at one of these current secondary indications and process that as a primary indication, saying, well, you know, sure, we can test all of these things if the patient is willing to participate, but, you know, we can also control spasticity in a manner that doesn't require medication, which has other effects. So from somebody that is implanted, do you think we're reaching too far too fast and should aim for something a little more as terrible as it is to say mainstream? <laughs> Some... You actually hit on a big um, discussion that happens around medical devices because um, if we try to go off on this grandiose target, that's a little bit harder to hit. It's also a hard time to hit when you try to go through the regulatory process. Right. So can you look at an outcome measure that is easier to attain, even though it can still do this grandiose thing? You know, Can you go for a smaller target to be able to get it through the regulatory process? And then you can look at other secondaries that you can build off of it, which is a much easier process to do. Right. Um, this is that whole discussion that's happening right now with epidural stimulation for people with spinal cord injury. Um, they've been trying to go after this walking and standing and all of that. Um, but really, some of the science that's now going on and being published is that it's actually improving. Autonomics is starting to improve um, uh, people's response for uh, autonomic dysreflexia. Um, it's improving circulation. So why don't we go after targets like that that are easier to hit, get it through the regulatory process, and then we can start putting on other indications, which is a much easier pathway to be able to get it to the market. So that's been discussions in medical device, in de medical devices for quite a, quite some time. And that's that's actually a, a big issue when it comes to trying to figure out, okay, now I have this really cool gadget. What am I gonna go after? Or what do people really want, you know, to be able to hit that target so that you can get it through and translated. Um, you know, it's part of what, you know, Kevin mentioned is that there was a 2004 paper which still gets um, cited today of priorities for people with spinal cord injury and, you know, the scientific community almost, you know, went on their head because people want sexual function and bladder and bowel function. That was their number one while everybody's looking at walking, right? right. So um, that's, that's really something in understanding how we design things and starting to change our philosophy on patient engagement initiatives before we start running down trying to find a solution is to figure out what real problem that you're trying to solve first. I think I think also in part working with you know the systems we have in place. I mean, the FDA was not necessarily built. We should probably. Uh, oh, out. sorry. Tis the time. <laughs> Tis the time. Tis Thank the you. time. Excellent. Thanks, guys. Thank yeah, you. good to spend time with you. Hey guys, hope you enjoyed it. I really liked it. I thought it was very interesting. It was really a treat. I mean, you know, I've, I've talked to Jennifer French a lot, so it's probably a little bit more normal for me uh, to talk to her. But, you know, the, the lab mates were really excited and, and even uh, Dr. Otto was really excited because you don't get to ask a lot of these questions. And actually, I was excited too because I got to hear other questions from a different perspective. And, you know, I, I ask my questions, but other people ask different questions and they're equally fascinating. So I really like this roundtable format. And, and, you know, we've had something like this in the past with uh, Doug Clinton and Avery Beddoes of Loop Ventures and Manfred Frank. Uh, and I really enjoy this because you're able to have a lot more creative ideas go into it and, and really find out a lot of new stuff that you would probably never find. So again, if you like this and if you like this kind of discussion, then I would highly, highly recommend that you go check out the Bioelectronic Medicine Forum in New York on April 4th. It's really, really cool. It is kind of more focused on investment and funding and new applications, kind of the kind of the leading edge of everything and it's really really cool to see what's going to be potentially coming out in the near future so again if you want to sign up for that go to neurotechreports.com or call 415-546-1259 and just mention you heard it on here in mineral implant podcast or just write something about the podcast on there and that that helps support me and you'll you'll be able to get uh, the free ebook 
book and maybe something else. I don't know. I might, I might throw in something. I might throw in something really cool in there as well. So we'll see. We'll see. But anyways, hopefully you guys enjoy it. Uh, hopefully you guys enjoy this type of episode and we'll see you at the Bioelectronic Medicine Forum on April 4th. Ciao. Hope you enjoyed the show and were able to learn something new, bringing together different fields in novel ways. Until next time on the Neural Implant Podcast.